Good afternoon to you all. Uh, I think we've had three very exciting days here at this uh, forum here, discussing challenges, hurdles, opportunities, how to, to bring gen clinical genomics to life right across the globe. As we saw, we wanted to sequence every baby or every person as soon as it's born, then use the information over time. Uh, and, but what we see right now, it's, it's not being maybe as adapted as fast as we want. Maybe we're in a hurry. Maybe it's just the pace. Uh, and it's not being uptaken uh, in an even way across the globe, or even in, within, within countries. So Illumina put together this great panel with uh, experts with different views of the topic. And we're going to discuss a little bit today how we can uh, accelerate the introduction of clinical genomics uh, of genomics into the, into the clinical care. Um, and without further delay, I'd like to get uh, um, Chris's point of view, because I think England really set a model of how to bring genomics to life in a public health system, right? I run a, a small project, it's like you, I just told you, it's like a copy and paste project of your pilot, 100,000 genomes in Brazil, and I saw all the problems we had to face to uh, put it together, even for a small number of patients, like 10,000 patients. So I'd like to get your view of how did you, what, what challenges you faced, what were the, 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 the most difficult aspects of getting to this maturity level in a public health system, so it'd be great to you. Thanks, Bosco. It's, um, I guess if we step right back, um, England, the UK has had this special relationship with genomics for a long time. Um, from Darwin to Rosalind Franklin to Crick and Watson to Fred Sanger to Selexa that um, you know, is now part of the Illumina family. Um, and also I think is unusual um, to some extent in having this single payer system, the NHS, that um, even though it is, is a rich and varied ecosystem uh, of its own, um, creates a framework within which we can implement things kind of countrywide, which is amazing. And the NHS has been doing uh, genetic sequencing in, in some forms really since its inception. Um, but then in terms of um, the adoption of these latest technologies at scale, um, the Genomic Medicine Service in the NHS, which at Genomics England we partner with, um, has really created a, a vehicle to, um, to do this at scale. So Genomics England was created in 2012 as part of the uh, Olympics legacy by Prime Minister David Cameron. Um, and the Camerons had uh, a kid, Ivan, who had a genetically uh, driven disease, Odahara syndrome, and who sadly uh, died from that. Um, and like many parents, they got very smart on the condition and on the underlying science. And it was partly through that process of understanding and empathy and leadership from uh, the Camerons, from the scientific leadership of uh, the UK at the time, that this moonshot project, the 100,000 Genomes Project, was conceived. Um, and so over the next few years, working with clinical academics, with the NHS, with uh, sequences like Illumina, um, the, that project was delivered on. Um, and it really brought together these worlds of research and clinical practice in a way that was very powerful. And that's now formed the basis for scaling up whole genome sequencing um, across the NHS through the uh, Genomic Medicine Service. So today we're doing um, thousands of genomes every month um, for people with cancer, people with rare diseases. Um, any uh, person under 25 in England who has cancer is eligible for whole genome sequencing, uh, various other forms of cancer, around uh, 50 different rare disease indications. Um, they're able to be treated straight into this pathway, and we're seeing incredibly encouraging uh, human stories about the impact that that's having um, on children, on families um, across the country. And I mean, I know we're going to talk more about some of the um, the challenges and you know the, the the machinery that we need to have in place to make that work at scale, um, but it's really everything from uh, the data systems and the the underlying data structures, um, the operations across you know 250 hospitals in England, seven regional genomic laboratory hubs, a centralised sequencing facil facility, all of the bioinformatics and analytics that needs to uh, happen to process all the data the clinical scientists who then look at those re results and then feed them back to um, the, the patients themselves. So it is, um, it is a pretty extensive set of systems that all have to work together 
to do this at scale. Um, and my kind of slightly flippant, but not really flippant point is, actually it all comes down to things like where do we put the freezer, right? So, <laughs> you know, to get uh, for the cancer whole genome sequencing pathway, we need fresh frozen tissue. Right. Um, and we literally have conversations like, well, we don't have space for a freezer. It's like, well, could you put it there? Well, there's a photocopier there. Where are we going to put the photocopier? <laughs> you know? So it's, it's everything from that through to how do we solve these incredibly complex scientific and technical challenges like tumor-only pathways or tumor normal contamination and so on that, that continue to push forward the boundaries of the science and the technology. But that's excellent, excellent, because we now have a model to follow, right? We, can, we <laughs> don't have to redo it. We just can learn from, from the example. So, so and from the UK, I'd like to go to Abasi, um, because to, to implement actually genomics and then clinical genomics, right, in low to middle income countries like, like mine too, it's, a, it's, a, it's another challenge, right? Yeah. First, we are underrepresented in all databases, right? We don't even understand our genomics in, in the right way, yeah. right? And then we have other competing problems, right? To, to, to suck up resources there. Yeah? We, mostly the time we don't have the EHRs, we don't have, so we have very specific and peculiar problems that I know you working on some of those. <laughs> I'd like to hear, you know, your view, how that can come to life in, uh, in countries and in continents like Africa. Thanks, Bosco. Um, so, in our cases, or in our case in Africa, it's more, I don't have the freezers, right? Yes, or, <laughs> sort of thing, yeah. <laughs> um, sorry. <laughs> it's a different um, challenge. <laughs> or, or we, we don't have power, you know, Absolutely. so how do we keep the samples, you know, um, alive? At, well, not alive, but how do you keep the samples uh, conducive for research? Um, but I think what's important here is that Africa is not a country, right? And it's good that we all know that. It's 54 different countries. 2,000 different languages are spoken in Africa. Nigeria has about three to 500 languages. We don't even know how many languages are spoken in Nigeria. It's highly diverse. Um, and modern humans actually all came from Africa. Now, I see the practice of genetics as you know, think about genetics as a pyramid with Africa at the bottom, right? It's meant to be that way. You have the, ver the variations on the continent of Africa. And in order for genetics to really be stable and utilized globally, you want to start from the bottom, from the foundation. Um, what I think has actually happened is we flipped it on the head. Um, we have sequenced and done genomics in, um, you know, in, in, in fewer populations, mostly Caucasian populations. And it's because, you know, of course, you have the resources there. Um, but it affects all of us, you know, because the more we don't include diverse populations uh, like what you have in Africa, we won't understand uh, how diseases affect all of us. You know, whether you're African or you're Caucasian or you're Asian. Now, what we did is we, we understood the resource limiting um, environment in Africa. Um, and we went in there and we decided that we're going to build ethically approved, um, informed, consented data sets, rich data sets that are combined with phenotypic records. And we had to create that conducive environment for that type of work to happen. And so, we, you know, I want to say thank you to Illumina because they're one of the first believers in what we did, helped us train people in Africa on how to sequence and for, you know, create some of the things you mentioned that you have across the, uh, the NHS. Uh, we've had to build all those capabilities uh, in Africa. We started in Nigeria, but like we said, it's 54 countries in Africa, hence the name of the company, 54G. <coughs> And the question here is how do we expand genetics across the continent of Africa to improve healthcare in Africa, but for also the global population? And that's what we're doing in, uh, in Africa right now um, regarding genetics. Excellent, excellent point of view. So, and just coming to the, to the US now, there's a different, uh, of course, challenge issue. I, I think it's, US has been, the, the biggest funder, right, of genomic research, I guess, right? UK is very strong too, but I think in general, it's, it's where the most funds come from. Uh, but I'd like to hear Scott's view on what's the role of government, right, the government of the US f to accelerate the implementation of clinical genomics. Is it only funding, right, like you're doing right now, all of us, several different programs, policy, 
creation like we did the GINA Act. Well, I think it was very important. I didn't know the impact, but looking from the outside, you think, oh, we need this everywhere, right? Not to use your information, genetic information, against you by an employer or an insurer, right? So what do you think, what do you think the, the role of government should be into, into this new era of uh, genomics? Well, you talk about um, it's certainly funding, but I think it's uh, a lot of it's coverage. And you know, you, you were talking about uh, unequal access between nations, and that's what we've been talking about here. You, you have inequities within nations as well, and I think when you look within the United States, you don't see equitable access to genomic screening in, in um, therapeutic areas where it's become highly relevant and where it drives better outcomes. Part of that is clinical awareness. Um, you know, you don't, you don't have the same awareness, certainly when you get into the community. Doctors uh, aren't routinely trained on the use of genomics in the clinical setting. Part of that is also cost. Costs need to come down. There's been a lot of discussion around Absolutely. bringing the cost down um, for sequencing here at this conference. But, but part of it also is the challenge of coverage as you move across different regions in the country and as you move across different payer systems and different insurance schemes. You have... Um, very differential access based on what coverage you have. And the system we have set up in this country, I think, is, a, is sort of a byproduct of the fact that a lot of the uh, sequencing services and a lot of the diagnostic panels are delivered as laboratory services. They're laboratory-developed tests. They're not FDA-approved tests. They're distributed as kits. And so that leaves a lot of discretion to um, payer systems, and Medicare in particular, to decide the rules of coverage, and basically wh whether or not a test gets covered, for example, in Medicare depends on where it's done. You know, every, every lab tries to open a facility in North Carolina to do their sequencing in North Carolina because that's where the best coverage is under the local Medicare carrier, and it shouldn't be that way. I mean, you should have a system that provides for more homogeneity across the country in terms of how this is going to be approached as a matter of coverage, and that's going to ultimately drive more equitable access. I think to, in that regard, there was a very big missed opportunity. About two hours ago, the president signed into law the FDA um, user fee reauthorization legislation, and what was supposed to be attached to that legislation was a fundamental reform for how diagnostic tests, panels, kits would be regulated by FDA that I think would have made it far more efficient for manufacturers to come in for FDA approval. And I think if we had a system where more manufacturers were able to come in for FDA approval of a lot of these diagnostic panels and these kits, um, it would drive more uniform reimbursement for how they're paid for and more national types of coverage decisions uh, in the U.S. And so this was a very big missed opportunity. Right now, you know, we're applying sort of a medical device paradigm to how we regulate diagnostic tests in this country, including um, sequencing panels, and what that means is that if you go in and get FDA approval for your panel, it becomes very hard to update it, because every time you want to update it, you have to file a new supplement to your PMA, and it's time consuming, it's expensive, and ultimately the tests that come in for FDA approval might not be as up to date as a test that's distributed as a laboratory developed test where, where you can update it on the fly. And what this legislation would have done would, would have fundamentally reformed the whole paradigm where you could have where FDA would take what we call a firm-based approach. And this was really 20 years in the making. We drafted this legislation when I was at FDA, um, but it was you know, sort of conceived long before I got to the agency. And what the legislation would have done was basically said, instead of regulating the diagnostic test itself, what we're going to do is regulate the firm that, that's producing the panel or the kit. And as long as they have good controls in place, as long as they have good validation, we're going to allow them to come to market with either new tests or certainly new iterations of existing tests without having to come back to FDA every time. And I think if you had a more efficient pathway like that, more of these tests would come in for regulatory approval, and I think that that would drive more uniform coverage through the marketplace. There's going to be another opportunity to um, get this legislation passed. This was sort of a, just not to be too wonkish, but basically Congress did a continuing resolution, as they often do, to fund the government to the end of the year because they couldn't come to a consensus on the budget. This got attached to that continuing resolution. They're going to have to come back and fund the full government at the end of the year. And so when they do that, they could potentially attach this piece of legislation, which has been drafted and marked up in committee and is all ready to go. I think there's a slim opportunity it gets done, but there's a possibility. And I think certainly if you start to get more people in the community saying this is a good thing, this is going to drive more equitable access to a lot of these new technologies in the marketplace, I think that could provide another impetus to get it done. But I, there's a lot of reasons why I think you see disparities in access here within the United States, but coverage 
I, I know we're going to talk about some of the others, but coverage is certainly uh, a big factor. And I think the right, you can't separate the way these products are being regulated from the way that they're being covered. Hope gets in. It's very important to get this modernization of these policies. Uh, Stacy, just to get your view on this, um, I know technology has a big role on, on, on democratizing access to genomics. We, we were mentioning in the back room like there that I can't think of anything like GATK, living without GATK, right? I think anyone who does data analysis here you know, uses GATK and it's an open source, was produced by Broad. So I think, uh, how do you see uh, the role of, of technology fostering this, uh, accelerating the clinical genomics, uh, adoption of, of clinical genomics? Right, thank you for that. Um, I mean, it's pretty clear to me that the biggest role technology is going to play, particularly the technology that we talked about so much here this week, is to really, you know, I think about increasing the, the breadth and the depth of these cohorts, right, that, that we will study the genomes of, that we can make new discoveries, and ultimately, you know, go from discovery to really attaching utility, right, to a certain finding, to an assay. And so, I mean, I think we... Uh, making a lot of strides when you think about all of the, the rare diseases that have been solved or new, new findings have been made, but there's many still that are not, right? And you think about the, the world of complex disease, right, where it's just going to be harder and harder to continue to find sort of the signal away from the rest of the noise, right? Because the variants might have small effect, there might be many of them, they may be population specific, they might be context specific, environmental exposure specific. And so, I mean, we're only gonna get to this, I think, by studies that are, that are way bigger than they have, in the, have been in, in the past. And I mean, I think that's what, one of the main things we're definitely looking forward to with this new sequencer, is to really increase the power of these studies. Excellent. Well, I'm going to just move on to a different, to a sub, subtopic here. That's um, data integration, right? We need, we, we're hoping to use this, this genomic information over time. Just Robert Green just came out of the stage here saying he wants to sequence the babies. We want to reuse the data. We want to bring all this panel data, whole genome sequencing, whole exome into, to life, to a HMR, right? To a uh, EMR or to integrate it to clinical data to be able to use it when you need it and, and over time. And I think we, right now we have the problem we mentioned here, that's the data silos, right? We, the, the data, genomic data, is still in, in separate silos, very hard to put them together. And I think that's especially important uh, for the underrepresented populations. I think even if when we're doing research on these places, it's hard to put together larger data, right, with nomad uh, depositories, for example. Or, uh, so what's your view of this? How, how can we improve this? How can we break the data silos? How can we integrate j data from African countries or other uh, minorities together with, with a larger pool of data that we can make sense of it um, in a general way. Yeah, I mean, there's a reason why we call it big data, right? The bigger the data, the more um, we can learn from that data. Um, but, you know, like you mentioned, all the silos, it's, it's really because of incentives. You know, have we figured out the right incentives to share the data, to communicate with each other? Um, on this panel here, a lot of data kind of is controlled by some of the people on this panel, right? And very quality data. But I think sometimes too, we, we don't necessarily have, we've not had the forums to discuss, to figure out what we can do. Yes, there are some consortia. consortia um, but many times too, you need to understand how a private entity plays with a public entity um, how do you incentivize a, a priv private entity to work with a public entity and vice versa? Um, and of course, it's the, also the interoperability of the data. You know, what are the protocols, what are the standards that are being utilized across um, all industries? Um, and I think that that's what we need to be talking about. Um, what are the right incentives? How do we figure out the right protocols? And how do we come together and partner? Right. And I think part of this has been done already, for example, in the UK. And I think you, you are the one using it at large scales, that thousands of samples of, of patients a month have been studied. That data is going to the electronic medical records. You created, I don't know how many years ago, the NHS digital initiative, right, to get these, uh, to get everything ready. 
Uh, so how, wh how was it? How is it working right now? It's still some stuff to do, to, to, to do or it's all done? <laughs> if only. <laughs> um, it's, uh, well, there's, there's lots of angles here, right? Um, but we're definitely not done. <laughs> the, I think you know, we've touched on this point about um, the fact that the data has to reflect the communities that we serve. And that, that's really important. We at Genomics England have launched a, a major initiative um, funded by the UK government to um, make sure that that's increasingly the case. Um, and I think there's a lot of the um, work that we're doing around engaging with diverse communities is also true just generally as a genomics community. We need to be better at listening and we need to just shut up. Right? <laughs> like, I have lots of slides that I talk to that just have a photo of an ear <laughs> and a photo of a mouth. <laughs> it's like stop talking and telling people why they should trust you, why they should give you their data. <laughs> just listen to them and understand where they're at, what their concerns are. Because ultimately, it's not our data, it's their data. It is the patient's data, it's the participant's data. And so I think the, the governance around this is really important. So at Genomics England, we've developed a participant panel which, uh, where members of the uh, people whose data is in the data set elect representatives, there are 30 of them at a time. They get to um, review applications to use the data. Um, they have a veto, which I can't overturn. Um, the, the chair of the board can't overturn. Um, and that has led to a really rich dialogue around what research work is happening on their data, how that's then being, fed, being used to feed back clinical results to patients who may not have got, got a diagnosis kind of first time round and so on. Um, so I think the points about diversity, the points about governance are really important. Um, and then there are just a ton of really, really serious technical challenges that we still haven't solved. Um, part of which are around taxonomies, um, you know, plugging together D data sets that have different phenotypic ontologies and you just immediately fall apart. Um, but also just this incredible, you know, we're living through a Cambrian explosion of different data types, right? The genomic data, the clinical data, um, the imaging data, multi-omics like proteomics, transcriptomics, and so on, which is amazing in that it allows us to build this kind of 360 degree view of, um, of a patient, of, of a cohort that they might be part of, um, but is also ex extraordinarily challenging, and, um, particularly in a world where you know, the clinical uh, sort of ecosystem is so varied, right? We've talked about the variety within the US. Um, if we think about the people in this room, I'm sure everyone is part of different healthcare systems. Even just within the, even within the UK, even within England, you have 250 hospital trusts on different EHR systems. Some of them are still using paper for test ordering. Um, you know, we need to somehow bring all of these pieces together because we know that, to your point about big data, the magic happens when we can actually um, it do this at scale. We can start to address some of the variants of unknown significance and build those knowledge bases. So lots, lots still to do, lots, lots of progress, but you know, an incredible amount of uh, work. And where I think standards are really important, uh, just last week I was in Barcelona at the GA for GH, Global Alliance for Genomics Health um, meetings. And I think that those initiatives like GA for GH that bring us together and try to shoehorn people into common standards are incredibly, incredibly important. Right. Just picking up on that, you know, I think that the, the reality is people who have rich data sets where they're correlating genomic data with phenotypic data, yeah, that, that has tremendous value. I mean, they're selling that data, they're capitalizing on that data, so they're not going to just hand give over. up the data, hand it over. But I think where you can get traction is building standards so that you can allow more people to collaborate between their data sets. Right. So you can start to allow you know, each individual who has a data set, an entity that has a rich data set to analyze their own data, they're gonna be in the best position to do that. They understand their own data set, but then create a framework where they can start to develop the consortia that you talked about. So you, you can start to consolidate findings into larger learnings. And do you see that happening here in, in the US? I mean, in day to day, I know we have yeah. a, several different institutions generating data, right? Several, several large institutions generating data, private someone, top Geisinger, you know, Broad, and many others. I don't think it's a privacy issue because, I mean, certainly there is. I mean, you, you can always come back and blame HIPAA, right? But, um, but people who are doing sequencing, even in, the pri even in the private sector, are getting pretty broad access to use of their data, and then they're, re they're oftentimes reselling the findings from that data for other purposes. So I, I, I think that that they have the ability to use the data. I think that there's not a lot of framework in place right. to, to allow convene them. these different silos to uh, you know, take on some of the big projects like you've done in the right. UK here in the US. Well, hopefully, I mean, to, to build on that, 
um, this is something that the All of Us research program right. will sort of, you know, help catalyze here in the U.S. because, you know, it, that, that this database is meant to be one that anyone can use and access if they're a bona fide researcher, right? And, you know, I think that if you think about all of the ways that this program can expand over time, it's not just the initial size of the data set or that we have whole genome sequencing on everybody, or we will over time. It's that the people who have agreed to participate have said, I want to engage with this program over time. Because the data itself is most, I think, will be most powerful in that longitudinal way, right? right to understand, you know, how people sort of, you know, develop disease or don't develop disease. Again, you know, different exposures. And so, I mean, I think that's our hope, right, in creating sort of like this resource that can be available to, to you know, eventually the, the whole world, right now the U.S., but eventually expanding, you know, much more right. broadly. And, and, and talking about data, I, I know you mentioned already that we do not have enough data, and, and I agree, I don't think we have enough data, for example, for the implementation of clinical genomics in several different areas, right? We are mature in some, rare disorders, you know, screening. But we are very behind, I guess, in many other areas, including one that you like, the common disorders, right? So how do you see, do we need, do we need to increase the investment in, in this genomic study of, uh, of common disorders? What do we have to do to get more maybe clinical utility and cost effective, eff effectiveness studies in place? So, so to, you know, make it easy for the payers to evaluate without cost effectiveness, only with clinical utility. Sometimes they look at the data and say, oh yeah, diagnostic yield is, is high, but what else, right? Sometimes, I, I, don't, I don't think we have done a great job on, in generating that kind of data to, you know, make it democratize access. Yeah. I mean, I think it really gets to, you know, engage, you know trying to engage you know, the, the people, you know, engage, engage the population in taking part and being willing to be part of these studies. Um, we have experience, um, and again, these are small effort, right, efforts right now, but we hope we'll grow over time in some sort of direct to participant, direct to patient efforts where you, you know, the, the, um, the, there's a great sort of metastatic breast cancer program um, that, that a colleague of, of mine at the Broad has launched where, you know, working with sort of advocacy groups, advertising on Facebook, you know, being part of like stand up to cancer, you're, you're saying to patients like, you know, would you like to be involved in research? And they do, right? Because it's for the future, it's, it's for their children. And I think it is a way to engage and, and let people put their hand up and say, you know, you know, count me into this, right? That's what the program is called, count me in. Um, but, <laughs> you know, I think that's one way, but of course that's not gonna probably be enough. You know, I'll make the statement that we'll need to study, you know, hundreds of thousands or a million people with heart disease to really get, you know, beyond all that heterogeneity. Um, and so you're not gonna get that just by one website. But I really, I think it's gonna be just a, a, you know, a long effort of getting, you know, encouraging participation in these studies. A lot of this is going to be driven by where the scientific opportunities are, by scientists and academic researchers working these things out, like we did in oncology. I think some of it's also going to be driven by where, the, um, where some of the commercial opportunities are as well, and we need to be cognizant of that, because any, any therapeutic area where you have multiple therapies competing, where you have a differential response to treatment, and you have, you have a, um, a biological basis for the disease that's different from patient to patient that could potentially be discern, discerned through genomic information, I think you're going to have an imperative to use to see how you can use sequencing data to differentiate patients based on how they're likely to respond to what are going to be costly therapies. There'll be a prerogative on the part of drug makers to drive that adoption and drive that science. There'll be a prerogative on the part of payers to do it as well as a way to target therapies more effectively. I think that's some of what drove a lot of the development in oncology as well. Not all of it. I mean, a lot of it was organic, came, came out of scientific endeavors. Most of it probably was, but some of it was driven by um, the co competitive landscape between different therapies. And so when you, and, and, and also therapeutic areas where you have access to tissue. And so when you start to think about um, the therapeutic spaces where those ingredients um, are at play, I think of things like um, immunology, you know, rheumatology, immunology, ulcerative colitis, where you're seeing more therapies come onto market. Um, so that, that's also, I think, gonna drive some of where the investments get made as well. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. And I think we have a lot of data, but we don't yet have enough, right? Because you might have a lot of data in cancers, but where did you get that data from? Have you looked at it in Mexico, in Brazil? Do you have, you know, equal kind of numbers in those places? Uh, because you were missing out of great insights, right? So 
the more you go to more uh, diverse populations and do the same cancer studies in Absolutely. Nigeria, in South Africa, the more novel uh, variants you might find that might move the, uh, the, the field forward. And I think that, yes, we do have a lot of data, but it's still not enough because it's not representative of the world's Absolutely. population. I agree. Yeah. And, then, and then you mentioned that we need people to get engaged, right? So we need to train, educate, maybe the citizens, we need to educate, educate, educate the, the workforce too, right? I don't think, I think it's very early, right? It takes, it takes many years to go through, you know, the cycle of med school, residency, uh, or, or to, to be, uh, the population to be aware of the benefits and, and the risks too, of using genomics. So one of, my, one of my favorite studies when I was in medical school I found was um, the best predictor of your clinical practice is what year you graduate medical school. Oh, right. So <laughs> your, your sort of clinical practice was stuck in time based on when you went to medical school. And I think that's part of the, to your it point, is. part of the challenge. And then I think we have to make, of course, an effort. I think right now, for example, in our country, it's very fragmented, the efforts most by commercial laboratories. So uh, uh, isolated uh, actions to, to build this literacy among clinicians and, and the patients. I don't, maybe you can hear from Chris what you're doing now. I know you have programs for, for patients and for, for, to training, for, training, uh, for the training of uh, clinicians. So how, how did that go? Yeah, so in... Um in England, there is an uh, organization called Health Education England that we partner with. We've put together a, um, a master's program, um, and there's a whole range of uh, kind of continuous professional development uh, courses and assets and so on. Uh, short videos, kind of Coursera style, um, self, self learning pieces. But I think, you know, I have a lot of sympathy with, you know, the point you make about these people have day jobs. And it's, you know, it's, to some extent, it's like, retrofitting air conditioning into a building that you've just built, right? It's really difficult. Um, and it's interesting, one way of thinking of Genomics England is kind of as an innovation partner with the NHS, with Health Education England and so on. But if we think about all of the different um, technologies, approaches, capabilities, that just that we've talked about in this session, right? Whole genome sequencing, transcriptomics, proteomics, metabolomics, um, polygenic risk scores, pharmacogenomics, I kind of have this mental image of all of these things being kind of arrows in flight, right, from kind of fundamental early science to, you know, translational research to, you know, pilots and proving out the concept, proving out the value, and then kind of landing them in clinical practice. If I was a clinician seeing all these arrows coming towards me, I would just think, oh my goodness, you know. So we have to, I think, both be quite empathetic about that and also um, work with those communities to understand how they can kind of come towards that, how we can make it easier um, for them, and also how we can use technology to do some of the heavy lifting. So we're already starting to see reasonably mature applications of machine learning and AI in areas like interpretation of digital pathology images. Um, we're seeing some of that in the interpretation of uh, genomic results. Um, we need to keep helping those highly trained, really busy people by doing as much of the heavy lifting for them as we can and making it as easy to kind of update their own practice um, you know, as we can. Right, and Scott, do you think government can help this, for example, uh, guiding medical curricula, for example, to include genomics literacy early? Anything can be done to accelerate this? As I said, I see much, many isolated actions, but not something concerted to bring this, even for the training, to train the physicians they're gonna use you know, upfront the, the, the information. Yeah, I, mean, I think government has a role to play. I think a lot of this is going to be organic, though. A lot of this is going to be driven, you know, to the extent that we want to educate physicians on this, this is going to be driven by the medical schools and their accreditation societies driving this into the medical education curricula. I think a lot of it's also going to be driven by um, the commercial sector, places where you have a prerogative for people to be investing in education of consumers and physicians. A lot of education in this country uh, is driven by companies. Uh, you know, companies market things to to doctors and patients, and so a lot of the resources for information getting to those communities is driven by the for-profit sector, and so that it's going to ultimately, you know, the the resources are going to be in the places where there's um, a financial imperative. Either you can help reduce costs, rationalize care, improve outcomes, um, help better direct therapy. Those are the places where I think you're going to drive some physician education. And again, we've seen that in oncology. I think oncology is a good a good model for how this happened. It just took too long. And we want to make sure the next time we have a, you know, sort of a, an important clinical application of this kind of screening, it doesn't take as long for it to evolve as it did in oncology. Right. 
and, and as, as you said, Abbas, we need representation, right, from, from the African continent or other countries that are not currently represented in these in this databases. And of course, consenting and getting people to know what they're uh, being part of, it, it may be even be harder for us at some point. So how, how are you going about this? To put all these folks, you know, <laughs> bring the data in. I mean, so we do have a, a very extensive network of, um, you know, people in sight. So we have like in Nigeria, for example, 50 tertiary hospitals working with us, hundreds of people. Um, you know, we have informed consent uh, translated into multiple languages um, and people there to explain to, you know, to, to the people who come into hospitals to participate. And transparency is very important. You know, you need to tell people what it is you're doing. You need to tell them why you're doing what you're doing. And I think what you find is the more you're transparent, the more people want to participate. You know, when we do things in a clandestine, or make it seem like it's a clandestine type um, action, people don't trust us, you know, and so they don't want to give you um, their samples, and they don't want you to have their data, because it's their data, it's, it's, it's their private thing, it's the one thing that is theirs that nobody else has. And so if you're saying to somebody, trust me, give me this, um, you need to show them why they can trust you. You need to be upfront to say, this could lead to the next big drug. You know, sometimes we tell people what we're doing, we don't tell them why we're doing what we're doing or what is going to come out from what we're doing. And so I think that, you know, as we continue in this field, the more transparent we are, um, the more we communicate with people, the more they understand genomics. Look at, look at what COVID did to PCRs. No one knew what, lots of people did not know what PCRs were. Now people tell you what PCRs are, you know, and people don't mind going to get PCR testing for different things. And I think that, you know, genomics is going to become the way of life in the future. Well, it should already be the way of life. Uh, and so the way we communicate to our participants um, is very important. You also have to return something of value to the patient. Yeah, yes. I think um, you know, pa patients will consent to give their data for altruistic reasons, but ultimately, if you really want to drive participation, I think if people are getting something back that's valuable, piece of information, something that they're learning about themselves or how they relate to a community, I think that's going to ultimately drive participation. And so let me just add something to that, because it's different in different parts of the world, right? So. When we do studies in Africa, it's hard, you know, we have to think, do we return genetic results back to a patient? And if you do return results, genetic results, is that a good thing for the patient or the participant rather? Because um, there's no infrastructure, there's no capabilities, there's no doctor to tell you what to do. You know, so one of the things we, of course, we've been working with other stakeholders uh, to think about how we start returning genetic results and, you know, how we build the, the support systems for that. But, you know, when we do studies, we also run other biomarker testing that are helpful and actionable in the hospitals. And that we do return to the doctors who provide it back to the patients and help them with their care. Um, but, you know, I think that we, I mean, I know that genetic counseling is, hard, it's, it's, it's in short supply all over the world, more so in Africa. Um, but <clears throat> there are differences. You know, we have to think about how we collectively solve this problem and understand that certain models will work somewhere, but may not work somewhere else. Yeah. yeah. Right. I mean, this, the way that this is playing out for us at the moment um, in the UK is when a patient comes into the genomic medicine service, they have two types of consent they can uh, explore. One is for the clinical test. Right. The other is for uh, the use of their data on a de-identified basis for research. Um, and one of the things we've worked really hard on is simplifying that conversation. Um, still today, I look at consent forms from a range of commercial providers, um, from other parts of the NHS system, from other healthcare systems, and it's kind of 30 pages 
you need a magnifying glass to see any of the text. You know, no human being, even a lawyer, right, really wants to read that. It's like the one we signed <laughs> like, for our COVID yeah, test uh, exactly. about an hour ago. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so scroll down and <laughs> I'm sure it's fine, right? Um, so we've actually got those consent forms down to about six pages. And the, the font is kind of 14 sub point. You know, there are some pictures, <laughs> there are some colors. You know, it's actually a human, it's a human readable document, which is, right. which is really important. But to do that, we had to have a lot of, um, let's say, debates, by which I mean basically arguments with kind of lawyers, ethicists, um, you know, others who are saying, oh, no, 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 but you need to explain these 17 different types of this thing, or these 230 types of this thing, or the, whatever. And you say, no one wants to know this. No one yeah. cares. You know, just, and no one will read that. You know, so can we please just give them the basics and then point them to where more information is if they want and so on. So I think a big part of it is just very practical. Yeah. How, do we, how do we have better conversations with people? And we're now seeing between 90 and 95% of people who are offered that choice to share their data for research um, do. And part of that is because they hope to get something back. Maybe they haven't got a primary diagnosis. Maybe they're hoping for another diagnosis. Maybe they hope that for them and the community of people who suffer their condition, this will help to get to a new therapeutic. But also, they're doing it out of um, you know, altruistic reasons. So I think both, both altruism and reciprocity are important concepts um, here. And transparency, as you mentioned, Abbasi, is, is, you know, has to be the foundation of it. Right? And then just going back to, quickly to the, the point of equity, right? We're, we're talking about this. And then I know, going back to you maybe, that in England, how, how do you make sure people from minorities are represented and are being offered, having this chance to use uh, genomics uh, in your program? Yeah. And then I would like to hear. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's hugely important. Our, our mission statement at Genomics England is to bring the benefits of genomic medicine to everyone. And that, that word is, everyone is really a big word and is really important. Um, we think about it in, I guess, at the risk of simplifying two kind of dimensions. Um, one is that no matter what kind of um, community or ethnic group or ancestral group you come from, that we're committed to um, having the right data and the right analytics in place to um, generate results and insights that are relevant to you, um, not based on other people, hence this big uh, initiative around uh, diverse data. Um, the other um, angle to this is also a, a sort of socioeconomic one, that if you're living in London or Oxford or Cambridge, or if you're living in Sunderland or um, you know, the, the Cornwall or wherever, you should have the same access to the same expertise, to the same uh, insights. And so in a system which is largely uh, very localized in the NHS, this is, we're making this strong argument that actually we need to have um, nationally coherent, nationally delivered um, services here to ensure that kind of equity of access to, um, to those tests. And I, mean, I think in terms of equity of access, just by virtue of the nature of the NHS, we're already right. quite a long way along that journey, but then we need to keep pushing to make sure that that's uh, truly, truly equitable. How we are here in the US, Stacey, in, in the US, right? How do you think, I know you have a very nice example of, of Broad, for example, making COVID testing very accessible from one day to the other, right? To the, yeah, uh, right. I mean, many I, million tests, then how, that's an example, right, to be followed. Yeah, I, I do think a lot about the experience of, of COVID testing and how that some of the things we learned, you know, could be pulled into and applied to genomics, although you know, genomic testing obviously much more complicated than COVID PCR. But, you know, we stood up a lab very quickly that had a capacity that, you know, matched large commercial labs. We were performing 150,000 tests a day, 24-hour turnarounds. Um, and we learned very quickly that it was going to make a big difference because we were providing access, providing testing to where there might not have been any or not enough, certainly. Um, and we were able to do this. We were able to offer it at a low cost. You know, we're a nonprofit institute, so we offer tests for $15, you know, where the large commercial labs were still, you know, north of, you know, $100 or so. So that encouraged a lot of testing where there might not have been any. And we also made sure there could be access to that test. And so we went through all of that logistical lift of creating a kit, getting the kit to the place, teach, teaching people how to order the test, and so, and getting a courier back to the Broad. Um, now, of course, the, you know, genetic testing is far more complicated, I know that, but I'm hoping that some of those principles of, of access, of, of low cost, of making it easy, 
right? And I'm, I think bringing in some of those, those, those features of, like, of telemedicine too, right? I mean, people who wanted to get COVID testing done in these scenarios didn't want to go to the, the hospital for obvious reasons. They didn't want to go to the clinic. They wanted to you know, drop it into a, a bag and ship it back to us. Right, and so I think that you know the pandemic. I probably I think has also changed a lot of that thinking around how telemedicine might evolve and open up access for genetic testing as well. So, so I um, just I'd like to hear. We have a few more minutes, maybe 13 minutes. So maybe we could hear your uh, view on what lies what lies ahead. Right, what what we should be doing next. I'm very optimistic about genomics. I think it's important. It's, one, it's going to be one key component, component of our health plan over life, over time. Not only we started by the low hanging fruit, let's say, oncology, treatment, diagnosis. We are now moving to harder stuff like predictive and preventive medicine, newborn sequencing, newborn screening. So, but, but I see that the future I think, is bright. I think it's going to be better, right? Bringing genomics in. So, what, what are your views of, about the future and what we should be doing? Well, I think genomics should get more global. Um, so we should have the same studies happening in multiple parts of the world. But the benefits of genomics should also get more global, right? So if we're developing new drugs because of genetics and we're doing studies in Africa that give rise to new targets, uh, is the pharma company behind that making sure that that population gets that drug back? Um, and I think that, and again, this goes back to what we talked about earlier on about, um, you know, what are the right incentives? Because incentives don't just work between the companies, it's also between the community um, and the company, between the participant and the company. You know, and we need to make sure that as we practice genomics going forward, that we are mindful about, you know, the community, that we, we make sure that we, we include people in different parts of the world. So of course, I'm African and we're doing this work in Africa. And if you talk to an African scientist, they want to be involved. Um, many of them have worked with lots of groups and have you know, recruited samples, but many of them still don't know how to do a, run a sequencing, uh, well, they don't know how to do sequencing. They don't know the data analytics because that level of capacity hasn't been transferred. Mm -hmm. And I think what we're going to see, if we're not careful, is a bottleneck from these populations because they understand that their data has value today. And if you want access to that data, then include us. Um, and I guess that's the voice. I'm becoming the voice of, of, of scientists in Africa. And that's something we're trying to do. But again, I want to say that the people in these communities want to participate. You know, they understand the power of genomics. And once we do with the right incentives, with inclusion, with the right equity mindset, we're going to see an explosion of new technologies and breakthroughs um, that make all of us, our lives better. I see, I see that happening, Chris. Well, I mean, like steps, yeah. I think the future is bright. <laughs> um, I guess maybe two, two things that we're focused on. One is trying to make it simpler and easier, right, to, um, to bring the benefits of these technologies to, uh, to patients um, and to make it simpler and easier for clinicians to use them. Um, if someone put a gun to my head and said, right, you've just, you know, used a remote to change the channel on your television, you know, explain to me in full detail how that works, you know, they would probably have to pull the trigger, right? And we need to make it easier for clinicians to use this technology, right? Without having to know how to do the wiring diagram and, you know, the, and the, the metaphor I have in my mind is the, the sorting hat from Harry Potter, right? The children's stories that I'm sure lots of people are, are familiar with. We need to get to the point where a, a patient can walk into the clinic and metaphorically, they put on the sorting hat, and the sorting hat says, ah, okay, you're a um, you know, black British 65-year-old um, guy, and you live in Dagenham, and we know this about your personal history, and we know this about your family history, um, you have suspected uh, bowel cancer, so we know that we're gonna get most value from doing um, RNA transcriptome, from doing uh, long-read sequencing and methylation, or whatever it is, 
Um, and you know, we can just um, help that person onto the right pathway because we have that knowledge base in the background for which inclusion and diversity, I think, is an input. But I think the, the output for that is we can actually do personalized recommendations um, well. So I think that making it simpler to get the right, um, the right approach for the right person in the right context is, is one. And I think the second one is we need to move from kind of looking in the rear view mirror to, to looking ahead. So most of the testing that we're doing today is around diagnosing a sickness that is already um, manifested. Um, and I can see Francis sitting in the front row here, and I know he would be sad if I didn't mention the newborns program here. <laughs> so, um, you know, we're incredibly excited about this, uh, this program of using whole genome sequencing at, at birth with, um, in our case, 100,000 babies whose, uh, whose parents decide to take part to try and prove out this concept of, can we stop looking in the rearview mirror? Can we start looking ahead? Um, can we get ahead of um, these conditions, whether they're very early onset, highly penetrant conditions that affect babies and young children and that are treatable, in which case, great, we you know, help them onto that pathway. Um, whether they're conditions which um, we don't have a treatment for yet, but which we need to develop treatments for. Um, or over the course of that baby's lifetime, um, how we can learn together what it means um, to be able to draw on that, those kind of insights from uh, the genome to help understand as a teenager about mental health, about uh, diabetes risk, about um, other uh, factors, into middle age about cardiovascular disease, cancer, into later years, you know, neurodegenerative um, and, and other conditions, how we start focusing genomics on health rather than focusing genomics on sickness, I think is gonna be truly transformational if we can get that, that journey right. Get there. Awesome. Well, I'd like to associate myself with Chris's comments that the future is bright, so <laughs> I'll start there. Um, I think that we need to make sure that, and we talked a lot about this on the panel, I still see situations where, in oncology, for example, where we see a lot of the applications where patients who clearly should be getting their tumors sequenced aren't because of how they're insured, but more commonly because of where they're getting treated. And we need to solve for that. We need to solve for that because ultimately that's going to, I think, drive more participation, drive the field forward, allow us to aggregate better, richer clinical data. We need to solve for that because ultimately it's the right thing to do from a public health standpoint. Um, and we have, we are in oncology, it's been slow. Um, there's still, still parts of, uh, of the landscape, and you probably see it as well, where patients, you see a patient who should have gotten their tumor sequenced and it wasn't, and you encourage them to go to another, an academic center or someplace else that's gonna do that, where there's clearly information that could be gleaned that's gonna potentially help direct them towards better therapy. Um, where the cost imperative is there, they could potentially you know, access lower cost therapy, they could certainly uh, achieve a better outcome. So it's not that the economic incentives aren't aligned, it's just that it, this hasn't been democratized. And I think ultimately we're gonna need to solve for that in the places where sequencing has penetrated and make sure that as it penetrates other areas of medicine, that up front we make sure we've solved for that going in so that you don't see this sort of slow migration where this starts first in the academic centers and slowly trickles down even after the, the clinical prerogative, prerogative for doing it has been clearly established. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, for me, yeah, future's bright. <laughs> I'm not going to say it's gloomy. You're optimist. <laughs> all, all optimists. Um, yeah, I, I, I think of two things. I think of, you know, a lot of excitement around some of these clinical applications where you know, the impact can be most likely found, right, and most likely seen in a real way. I think the newborn case is a, is, a, is a great one. I think, you know, getting to use polygenic risk scores, another one I think we'll, be, we'll see over time. A, a cheap test, right, that can actually make a difference. You know, it can tell you something about what might happen to you and, it, you know, why not have it on everybody? But I know there's a lot of implementation questions right. there, but, but I do think those are, those are ones that we'll see and I think that we should celebrate, you know, victories around it. Um, and then I guess the second thing I, I can't help but thinking about is, you know, we really can't, you know, take our foot off the gas when it comes to, you know, the discovery side of things, right? And I mean, these, these big population cohorts are great, but, but what about more case control? You know, what about, you know, we have to get to the million people with heart disease and a million people without, and are we putting the effort of the, you know, the governments into continuing to build these cohorts? I mean, someone on the stage this week said, well, we've made the discoveries, now let's go translate them. But I think there's a lot more, <laughs> a lot more discoveries to make. So, you know, I, I hope we don't, we don't lose sight, sight of that as well. Thank you.
Yeah. I'd like to thank you all of you for sharing the knowledge with us. And we know, you know we've done a lot, we've seen, but we still have a lot to do. It's good. We don't want it to be out of job anytime soon, right? So thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>